From our boat, the individual islands of the Tuamotu Islands are seen as mere tufts of palm tree tops on the horizon and cannot be seen until one is within a nautical mile or two of their reefs. So one must be ever watchful while navigating this archipelago of atolls in French Polynesia. This particular chain of islands forms the largest chain of atolls in the world, numbering 78, and spanning an area in the South Pacific roughly the size of Western Europe. These coral islands, the Tuamotus, meaning in Polynesian, low islands, are essentially high sandbars that were built upon colourful coral reefs and have a white, coral-bottomed, crystal-clear, turquoise-enclosed lagoon teeming with marine life. Each atoll is essentially a little group of islands or motus that encircles a lagoon and grows upwards upon itself as the main island subsides or erodes away. Atolls arise only in warm waters, therefore they are only found in the tropics and subtropical oceans. The largest distribution of atolls is located in the South Pacific, but may also be found in the Indian Ocean and in the Caribbean. The early history of the Tuamotu Islands is shrouded in mystery, with archaeological findings leading to the conclusion that the western Tuamotus were settled by people of the Society Islands in about the year 700 of the modern era. Some of these islands have evidence of marae, flat ceremonial platforms made of coral blocks dating from the earliest years. The Tuamotus are divided into groupings, the Rifsky Islands, the Palliser Islands, the King George Islands, the Hikuera Group, the Howe Group, the Far East Tuamotu Group, the Duke of Gloucester Islands and, this name being my favourite, the Disappointment Islands. The arrival of our boat, Winter Sea, at Raroria did not make the headlines like that of the archaeologist and anthropologist Thor Heyerdahl, who sailed from South America and crashed into the outer reef of Raroria on his raft, Contiki. But our experience could not be more memorable. In 1947, Heyerdahl's arrival inspired one of his crew members, Bengt Danielson, to remain here and to study the economy and society. He wrote a thesis about Raroria and of his work and life on Raroria, as well as his 1952 book, Raroria, Happy Island of the South Seas. In it, he observed, the Raurian peace stems from the fact that the people have no material anxieties and no other object in life than just to live. In order to enter the lagoons of these atolls, one must traverse the narrow pass through the outer reef at slack water when the tide changes from going one way to the other and is, for a short time, still, for the water rushes at such a pace during tidal flows that it is unsafe to enter them. The small islands and coral walls making up the outer reef protect the enclosed lagoon from the relentless ocean. Schools of fish swim in the shadow of our yacht this is truly another South Pacific paradise. Raroria is of the Rifsky Islands group and lies directly south of its twin, Takume. At the last census, there were less than 200 people living on Raroria, though a tiny airport and concrete runway now serve the islanders in times of medical emergency. The lagoon is dotted with dangerous coral reefs and is difficult to traverse safely. Through the centuries, these islands were visited by the Dutch, the Portuguese, the British, the French, the Spanish, the Russian and German explorers. But Ferdinand Magellan was the first of the early Europeans to arrive here in 1521. Raroria has a village of few residents, has a church built from coral, an elementary school and a shop where one can buy a few basic items. The older children attend secondary schools in Makimo, a neighbouring bigger island. We were surprised to see such different levels of wealth on these islands as we passed by these two graves, paused and wondered at this juxtaposition. This elaborate grave beside the poor rotting cross standing at the head of the grave of a dead child. 
Fifty years ago, these two Omoto islands made international headlines when the French carried out nuclear weapons testing on two of the remote atolls in the furthest southeastern Tuamotu group, nearer the Gambia Islands. France officially established Mururua and its sister atoll, Fangataufa, as nuclear testing sites in September 1962, and testing took place between 1966 and 1996. France was responsible for 181 explosions, causing international protests, notably in 1974 and again in 1995. Greenpeace stated this of the first nuclear test. It sucked all the water from the lagoon, raining dead fish and mollusks down on the atoll, and it spread contamination across the Pacific as far away as Peru and New Zealand. A total of 41 atmospheric nuclear tests were conducted at Mururoa, and all testing was finally abandoned in 1996. These islands are still off limits to visiting cruisers and are uninhabited, but the nearby surrounding atolls are still home to Polynesians. We nervously looked for eerie glows on the horizon to the south of us, but we could not see it. Our arrival at this remote atoll coincided with that of the delivery ship, which made its regular stop only once a month. This deep hulled ship cannot safely tie up at the dock, for the water is too shallow, so the captain has to anchor out in the deeper waters of the lagoon. Its coming creates a buzz of activity as local small boats approach the ship. All sorts of goods are brought ashore by the enthusiastic locals, food staples, fuel, construction materials such as wood, cement and nails, roofing materials and wire fencing, and fishing supplies. Copra is taken in exchange. This happy day had the entire population lining the dock awaiting their order or aiding in the transfer from the anchored ship. Everyone was jolly and smiling. It's the highlight of the month. Little boats brought supplies to the little village where we were anchored, while others dashed away across the lagoon with their own share to their own motus far in the distance. Living aboard a sailboat is somewhat like having a cottage by the sea. We have often referred to Winter Sea as our home at the seaside with full sea views and wraparound decks, a couple of bedrooms and bathrooms, a full kitchen, a dining area and a sitting room with all the comforts of home. But the greatest benefit of all is that a sailboat allows you to take your home with you across vast oceans and enables one to experience the wonders of the world where few others are able to go. Winter sea lies calmly at anchor, rolling with the waves, but the moment that we raise the mainsail and unfurl the jib, Winter Sea transforms herself into a powerful machine, slicing through the ocean, driving on and vibrating with great intensity and power, uniting with the elements of the earth and with nature. Now she rests. Our stay at Raroia was much too short as we made plans to visit the next Tuamotu atoll, Makimo, and to escape from this turquoise lagoon during tomorrow's slack water between the tides. As evening came, the sun lit the sky with a saffron and orange glow. The lagoon took on a deep purple hue and we slept. Makimo is also of the Rifsky Island group, like Raria. Makimo's lagoon has two navigable passes. We entered at the southern pass, anchored overnight, and next day sailed the length, 70 kilometers, of the long, narrow, emerald and turquoise lagoon, through the maze of markers, past pink sand beaches, and we spent a few days in the village of Pueva before exiting the lagoon via the northwest pass. 
Although pearling and tourism are promoted, the coconut copra culture remains most important in the economy of this island. Most recently, Makimo's administrative centre for the 11 other islands is slowly becoming a large employer and the primary source of income. Puheva is a busy little community with over 300 of the 940 island residents, large administrative buildings, shops, churches and a boarding school for outlying island children. Jack London wrote of Makimo in his book, The Seed of McCoy. We need a breeze tonight or else we'll miss Makimo. What's become of the southeast trade? the captain demanded. Why don't it blow? What's the matter? It's the evaporation from the big lagoons. There are so many of them, McCoy explained. The evaporation upsets the whole system of trades. It even causes the wind to back up and blow gales from the southwest. This is a dangerous archipelago, Captain. Makimo is home to legendary hero Moeava a famous warrior who performed many feats in the Tuamoto archipelago. Legend has it that this famous soldier, Moeava, fell in love with Huare, a beautiful woman of the islands. Huare was also loved by Patira, a giant of a man. The two men fought for her love here on this island of Makimo. Moeva made a giant sling in which he would shoot rocks at his opponent. Patira arrived, prepared to challenge for Hawari's love, but the girl, desiring only the love of Moeva, picked a great round smooth stone, made a pledge to the sacred god Oro, and killed the giant Patira by beating his brains out with the big stone. Now the enormous round smooth stone can be seen in the lagoon of Makimo, the stone of Moeva. Makarava was first explored by the Russian explorer Fabian Gottlieb von Bellinghausen in 1820. Then in 1888, the novelist Robert Louis Stevenson cruised into this rectangular shaped low atoll of Fakarava, stayed for four weeks and wrote of it in his great novel, In the South Seas. Jack London also wrote a story about this area, The Seed of McCoy, written in 1900, and he mentions the ship Pyrenees running ashore on the outer reef of Fakarava, clawing off the reef before safely beaching in Mangareva in the Gambier Islands. In his book, Jack London wrote, Another hour passed. The three watchers aloft stared intently into the pearly radiance. What if we miss Mangareva? Captain Davenport asked abruptly. McCoy calmly considered. He did not refer to the chart. All these islands, reefs, shoals, lagoons, entrances and distances were marked on the chart of his memory. He knew them as the city dweller knows his buildings, streets and alleys. Without shifting his gaze, he answered softly, Why, let her drive, Captain. That is all we can do. All the Tuamotus are before us. We can drive for a thousand miles through reefs and atolls. We are bound to fetch up somewhere. Look here, old man, I won't be beaten. These Tuamotus have cheated and tricked me and made a fool of me. I refuse to be beaten. I'm going to drive this ship and drive and drive and drive clear through the Tuamotus to China. But what I find a bed for her. If every man deserts, I'll stay by her. I'll show the Tuamotus. They can't fool me. My ship, she's a good girl, and I'll stick by her as long as there's a plank to stand on. You hear me? This is Raraka, said McCoy. A few miles farther on, a current flows north and turns in a circle to the northwest. This will sweep us away from Fakarava, and Fakarava is the place for the Pyrenees to find her bed. Hold her up, Captain, McCoy said as soon as he reached the poop. That's the easterly point of Fakarava, and we'll go in through the passage full tilt, the wind abeam and every sail drawing. 
But you are bucking a seven knot current, Captain, he said. The speed that the full ebb runs out of this passage. Fakarava is the second largest atoll in the archipelago, set amidst numerous unexplored motus, pink sand beaches shaded by rows of coconut trees, coral reefs, crystal clear waters, rare fauna and flora that are a delight to see. It is home to a relaxed Polynesian community with seemingly less anti-French animosity than in the Marquesas and many black pearl farms. The outer reef is teeming with tiger sharks, loaches, barracudas and hammerheads. They prowl the waters in great numbers off the Fakarava Atoll. It was Charles Darwin who first thought about the origins of coral atolls and his subsidence theory of coral reef formation has received universal support. The youngest of the islands are the Marquesas, older are the Society Islands, and the oldest are these coral atolls, the Tuamotu Islands. They are also the oldest of the islands in the South Pacific, and they developed from a gradual subsidence of what started millions of years ago as extinct oceanic volcanic islands. These volcanoes gradually arose from beneath the sea, these became the Marquesas. Then barrier coral reefs grew around the volcanic island, enclosing the island and lagoon like the society islands around Tahiti. Finally, the central volcanic islands subsided into the lagoon and disappeared, becoming what we see here in the Tuamotus. The corals whose symbiotic algae require light to grow, continue to build the reef upward toward the sea surface, maintaining the top of the reef in the sunlight that they require. As the subsidence continues, the fringing reef becomes larger and farther from the middle, and the lagoon grows bigger and deeper inside. Here in the Tuamotus, the cold, extinct volcanoes have sunk so far that they have disappeared beneath the surface, leaving behind the characteristic ring-shaped reef surrounding an open central lagoon. Thus, atolls are built on thick layers of dead coral reefs. Scientists have drilled over 1,400 meters through coral limestone before striking volcanic rock on Pacific atolls, supporting Darwin's hypothesis that atolls develop as fringing reefs subside. Fakarava is often referred to as the dream island, where the climate is virtually unchanged year around and the rainbow of blues, greens and purples makes Fakarava a diver's paradise. The rich ecosystem is home to rare birds, plants, crustaceans and sea life. UNESCO has recently recognised and identified Fakarava as a biosphere reserve. Even the locals respect this designation so they now farm fish inside confined areas like these. Pens are strategically placed throughout the lagoon, holding various species, enabling easy access to a variety of fish, and this allows them to hunt from the bow of their powerboat with spears. The children watch lazily, adding encouragement and pointing to the fish of their choice in this hot afternoon sun, as the Pacific laps the outer reef of this immense lagoon and the women select dinner in this most non-traditional way. In a world apart, deep in the South Pacific, on this remote island paradise. Toao has a wide lagoon, 35 kilometers in length and 18 kilometers in width. Captain James Cook was the first European to sight Toao in April 1771. But it wasn't until the beginning of the 19th century 
when the missionary traders arrived that they began harvesting the island's pearls for the European market. Almost all pearls are now cultured artificially, including here in Tawau. The pearls, however, are no less real for being cultivated and not hunted. This atoll is very lightly populated and mostly occupied by Gaston and Valentin's family of less than 40 people. This lagoon is too shallow to be accessed with a yacht, but here, in what is the pass into the lagoon, moorings have been made available for passing cruisers. Gaston greeted us with a huge smile and tied winter sea to the mooring. The families depend primarily on the cultivating of pearls and have very little contact with the outside world. They live from the sea, make rare visits to Fakarava for supplies and appreciate anything that passing cruisers can spare in trade for pearls. Whenever they accumulate a sufficient number of yachts in the anchorage, they prepare a lovely feast with coconut bread, lobster caught at night from the reefs, poi poi, fish and coconut crab, all specially prepared for their guests at a nominal fee. We reserved our place at this lovely table to enjoy the superbly cooked food and look out upon winter sea at anchor where she rolls gently in this lovely protected anchorage. The South Seas are responsible for producing the world's largest and finest saltwater cultured pearls from the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, Cook Islands and eastward through to Tahiti and on to the Tuamotu archipelago and the Gambia Islands in French Polynesia. The pearls of Tuau are Tahitian pearls and the most sought after South Sea cultured pearls. The art of pearl cultivation is a long and delicate process. Man had been trying to unlock the secret of the pearl's beauty as far back as 1000 BC. But it wasn't until the early 1900s that Kochiki Mikimoto successfully grew a pearl. The best pearl farms are located in lagoons with active tides flushing them with clean salt water. The water must remain pollution free which makes these lightly populated islands ideal. Pearls have been a source of fascination for centuries, considered the most magical and feminine of all gems, and are amongst the few gems created by a living organism. Pearls emanate a certain warmth and glow not found in other gems, partially due to their unique beginnings. Pearls are created when a foreign body, such as a grain of sand or other foreign spot, finds its way into a pearl oyster. The oyster reacts by coating the irritant with layer upon layer of the pearly substance known as nacre. This unique relationship gives birth to the natural pearl, creating its unique appearance and iridescent beauty. Today, cultured pearls are created to fill a steady supply of pearls and to satisfy the demands. Humans, rather than nature, introduce the irritant. The process begins by inserting into the oyster a nucleus and a tiny piece of mantle cut from another oyster. The mantle is first extracted from another oyster. This is the part of the fleshy oyster lip that secretes nacre, the mollusk's natural protective response. It is carefully removed, trimmed, shaved, cut and kept alive to be transplanted into another oyster. Then it along with a tiny plastic bead, form a nucleus which is transplanted into an oyster to grow a pearl. The longer it cultivates, the thicker the nacre and usually the deeper the luster. The embedded oyster shells are then suspended from racks on panels supported by buoys floating in the lagoon. Intensive husbandry is required for the next 20 to 24 months these large black lip oysters will hang on lines in clean and clear lagoons, building the beautiful dark nacre that distinguishes these pearls as the queen of pearls. The outer oyster shells are cleaned monthly to keep them free of marine growth like barnacles, and the oysters feed on small algae found in the water column. 
The pearls are harvested during the months of June and September. Once the pearls have been taken out of the oysters, they are initially sorted, usually by shape and size. The oysters are seeded anew and the cycle begins again. A healthy oyster can be reseeded as many as four times with a new nucleus. As the oyster grows, it can accommodate progressively bigger pearl nuclei. Therefore, the biggest pearls are most likely to come from the oldest oysters. A cultured pearl appears to be every bit as natural as one that originates in the wild and can only be distinguished from natural pearls through the use of x-rays which reveal the inner nucleus of the pearl. Otherwise, one cannot tell the difference. Tahitian pearls have unique characteristics with their rainbow variations of colour. The value of each pearl is determined by its colour, luster, shape, size, pearl surface and nacre thickness. Each is graded for value. Sometimes there are little imperfections on the pearl surface, but they do not take away from the beauty. These little bits of sand that found their way onto the layers of nacre simply add character. Round and semi-round are the most valuable, but also valuable are rare shapes like teardrops and buttons. Black pearls reflect light in a different way from a white pearl. Black pearls are not necessarily black, but can vary from black to dark or light grey, dark or light green, pinkish, blue and bronze brown. The size of the pearls directly affects the price, with the larger pearls being the most expensive. Tahitian pearls are left longer in the water than in other areas of the world, therefore forming a thicker nacre. Only a fraction of the cultivated oysters actually produce a fine pearl, and some do not produce at all. Tahitian pearls display a pure richness, are big and bold, cool against the skin, flattering when worn and are pleasing to the eye. They are absolutely stunning and they make gorgeous jewellery and one of the most desirable of gems today. Day by day and year by year, these motus and atolls change, ever growing and expanding. Perhaps in five or ten million years from now, a volcano will push to the surface and another ten million years later, the island will sink back into the sea to form another atoll. We are glad to have visited these unusual islands and we take from this remote chain of Tuamotu atolls the experience of a lifetime, a little pouch of pearls and a thousand memories in pictures, experiences and journal entries. We feel sad to leave but we are grateful for the memorable moments. Sailing the South Seas is the perfect place to be alone, but one never feels lonely.